And we're about to welcome that very, very familiar voice to our SEN listeners. Jared Whaley is joining us on the run home. Welcome, mate. Sean, Scope, hello. <laughs> He's up and about. You're just as up and about as, uh, as Scope is, Jared, on this uh, Monday. What we all thought was going to be day four, but uh, but here we are. We're having to fill in for the boys on, uh, as I said, on what was going to be day four. What was your sort of overall, what did you walk away with from Adelaide Oval after that uh, emphatic victory by the Aussies? It was a test match played at warp speed, that's for sure, <laughs> which is uh, why we're all having the, having a different sort of day today. Uh, it, it, it was outstanding from Australia. They that notion of putting things right. So they were terrible in Perth, like alarmingly terrible. Mm. And they had a checklist to rectify and, and they did it from the very first ball. I feel like that that's about all you can ask from a team is um, you can say what you like between contests and it's how you present into the next one. And they, from the very first ball where the wicket was taken, they seized control uh, the batting survived the tricky period at the end of day one, when they'd completely collapsed in Perth, uh, individual players were far better. Their cricket was sharper. And, yeah, so it's it's amazing, really. They lost so heavily in Perth, and they win so heavily in Adelaide. Mm. So, gosh, it sets things up so well at 1-1. Who, who's the pressure valve released the most, Jared, after going from test one to test two? Who's, who's under the least amount of pressure after a you could sort of say across the board for Australia after I, the uh, yeah, I dominant think, win. I think logically Manus Labashane because mm. he that was a long term rough averaging thirteen across ten innings. So in previous generations he wouldn't have got the eleventh innings, but this is a team that values support and stability. So he did the he did the work. He clearly diligent and determined between test matches. Um, he progressively clawed his way out of the slump and then he stroked his way back into form. So the question around whether he would remain in the team is lifted. He'll play all five tests now. But I still think the second part of it is, so 64 is meritorious for where he was, but number three is about making centuries, churning out centuries in test cricket. So that's Marnus's next step is to, is to get back to that because the top order, it's been the, the dearth of top order runs that has been the problem for Australia over the past 14 months or so. And even 337 was better, but industrial sized runs start with a four in front of them uh, on home soil. And, and so that's what Australia needs. And then I think the whole setup, um, they remain very calm while we all overreacted, but that's not to say that the, the specific criticisms were extremely valid. Uh, and had Australia played like that again, mm. um, that then then change would have been inevitable. So I think the whole the whole setup releases the pressure valve. They were they were confident they would do this. They did it. It's one one. So back to business. Uh, and that yeah, that will serve them well, I think. Well, yeah, were they as calm as is sort of the way they portrayed it last week? Because everyone, everyone seemed pretty level headed. Now you look at yeah, it's yeah. completely turned to India now because then everyone starts looking at India. Three 0 loss to New Zealand over in home soil. Then they rectify that by having a, a really big first test. Now the pressure's back on India. Yeah, so I think the first lesson of it is having overreacted. So I, I, this is me as everyone else can take their own view is having overreacted on the first test. Don't then flip flop on the second test for the rest of the summer. I think there's a bit of a phenomenon with modern sport and certainly modern test cricket that one test doesn't affect the next and the next. Like maybe we have known in the past where momentum in a series was worth so much. This, this age of player just seems to be able to isolate each match and not worry about what has gone before. Now, maybe that's the necessity given uh, the amount of games that they play virtually from one day to the next, as you just have to let the past go and get on with improving for the next one. So I, I wouldn't, because the, the results are so wildly apart, I, I wouldn't hold any views about what it means for the third test. Uh, and I don't think... India have got a couple of decisions to make. I'm sure they'll make a decision around... I doubt Rana plays again. Australia completely got hold of him. The, the real issue is whether Boomer is fit or not. And if he's not, then that, that has a huge influence on the series. But they've got, they've got fast bowling depth, which they've brought to these shores, and they've still got options with a spinner as well. So my personal view with India is they will rationalise that and go, we don't play very much pink ball cricket. We made 
a series of mistakes is they had a great position on day one and lost three wickets in 16 balls. They missed McSweeney in the night session when he was on three, and that was the way into the Australian order. And then they dropped head when he was on 76 when the game was still in the balance. So if you rectify those moments, then you, you've got a much closer test match. The last time they were in Brisbane against a red ball, they won. So they can take some confidence there. So, yeah, I don't think... Uh, I, I, these are isolated events that get us to 1-1, and I think India will keep their heads and be a formidable challenge in Brisbane. I don't want to get off the pressure valve being released just yet. I want to hear your views on who's the pressure, because I think I know the answer, and I've got uh, my views, and I think most of Australia does, but I want to hear it from um, from from your, uh, in your own words, Jared. Who is the pressure really ramping up now for the Aussies, now that Marnus has sort of re- relieved that pressure for himself? Yeah, so this is and th- so these are two different conversations, right? Mm-hmm. And the team is totally settled. Uh, people will look at the Kawaja form and the Smith form, two aging batters and where they are. They will play the entire series. Yeah. This is what we learnt, uh, and this is not a lesson to be missed. Uh, and I- I've learnt it is this team where where I lean towards accountability and uh, and rational change or proportional change this setup values above all else stability and support and now that they're one one and not down zero two all of these players will play the series and they might make the odd adjustment here or there around a bowler i think there's a good chance that webster might make his test taboo as things go along um as cover potentially for for mitch marsh but that batting lineup at the, the top five will remain that way for the entire series so it's an interesting debate on the outside. Mm. It's not pressure to hold positions. It's pressure to do the job. Uh, and to that end is is Kawaja and Smith have got to find their way through these, the difficult fading years. We live through these with Dave Warner. It's, it's diminished returns and there's no shame in it because it happens to all all of the greats, all of the good established batters. It's diminished returns as age goes on. Kawaj did a good job to occupy in the night session for just long enough that Boomer couldn't have a sustained go at uh, at Manus at three. And Smith is still battling with the leg theory that he's getting all the time and he hasn't solved that yet. But I bet he does at some point during the series. So yeah, the pressure is on the top order to make industrial-sized runs, but there is no pressure for places in the team. What about Scotty Boland, mate? He was really good again. Every time he gets an opportunity, he comes in and he plays really well. Is he just going to be one of those guys, like when they've got the perfect lineup and, and Hazelwood's back in, he's just going to be a guy in a really good era that, you know, sort of the next man up because he just he just always delivers when he gets an opportunity. It's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? He, he is such a good... He's such a good fourth bowler to have. And Australia loses nothing when there's an injury and he comes in. He has an uncanny knack of performing immediately within a spell and immediately within a series. I hope he plays again in Melbourne because that's where he really is the specialist horse for the course. Um, But if Hazelwood is fit, he'll come back into the team for Brisbane. So for a little while there, Boland's form and his numbers had him you could really make the case that he was ahead of Hazelwood when Hazelwood was going through a couple of summers of injury but then when Hazelwood got back as the metronome that he is he's nearly Australia's best bowler so yeah Boland is fourth of four but Australia loses nothing when they call on him it does give them the capacity across a five test series to to stay fresh which they should use I'm absolutely certain they made a mistake last summer playing all seven test matches with the same bowling lineup when Boland was there, as he should clearly have played a couple of times along the way. Uh, and I hope he does play twice in this series. I hope he plays again on Boxing Day. What about the uh, the atmosphere at Adelaide, mate? Uh, the pink boards obviously worked mate. really well for Australia. Um, our captain here on, on the run home, Brooksy, was mentioning that it broke records in only three days. So there's clearly people that love the version of the game and, and seeing the pink ball and, and, and getting involved in it in the afternoons. Do you think there's an opportunity for more of it? I, I personally do, but they're not going to, as the, the stated policy is just one pink ball test a summer. Uh, and then there's the curiosity for the Ashes. It's going to be in Brisbane rather than Adelaide. And I think that's that's such a shame and such a such a strange decision because... Adelaide is the perfect test match in the way that it is. And it's the, clearly the best test match of the summer. Um, they say 25% of, of those who attend come from outside South Australia. 
because it's just such a great week to be a part of. It 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 is the centerpiece of the town, and I'm not sure whether you've been there, but the the link between the ground just over the bridge, and then you're at the mm. hotels and the bars and the restaurants. It's, it's all there. Um, the sense of reverie and bonhomie around the streets is absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's as I say, if you're on the circuit, it's by far and away the best test match, and it's a secret that people have learnt. Uh, and I think it's such a shame that it, that it won't be the pink ball test next year. That, they'll have a great red ball test, and there's there's an old part of the the South Australian membership that craves the way things were and wants the day test match, and then the restaurants at night. But I do think they've discovered something better. It looks better. It feels better. Um, yeah, so it, uh, um, I'm an unabashed fan and I wish it was pink ball again next year. Just on that decision to not have more of it, A, it's a bit of a two-part question. A, whose decision is that? And B, um, is it some of the Indian like dominance in decision-making in world cricket that they don't want more of it? Is there any of that involved in that, Jerry, or am I sort of... No, too much, too that, that's it. entirely Cricket Australia. Yeah, that's yeah. entirely Cricket Australia's choice. And um, Nick Hockley reiterated that with us during this test match. Is, I think you, so I, if in a five-test summer, I would have two mm. pink ball. I'd actually have Sydney as the second pink ball test. I think it would be utterly superb at the SCG. Um, but they, they are happy with it being one. Uh, the players are still not, they're not absolute devotees of the pink they are, they're slowly getting there and hopefully the next generation is a bit more a bit more embracing of it um it changes the circumstances a little bit but i actually think it adds so much where some fixate on what changes i just think it adds so much to the, the rhythm and the dynamic and the tactics and the possibilities within a test match and um, but i think mainly is put put cricket where the people are and that's that's in prime time so in a five test split Three in the day and two in the night just seems absolutely perfect to me. And I just want to get your um, opinion quickly, just spinning it back to the test that's just gone. Obviously, tra- uh, Travis Head and Mohamed Siraj was a, a bit of a talking point. I think there's some news break recently that they've actually sort of been formally charged is the wrong word, but there's a uh, something more formal has, has been handed down. What was your take on the on the whole incident, in inverted commas, Jared? Yeah, so I... It is an incident, and they they have been charged by the match referee, and I think that's inevitable, is if you have a bust-up like that, particularly early in a series, and you don't enforce the rules around it and the punishments, it's not a huge offence, but it is worthy of sanction, then you'd leave what happens next um, if you don't pick this moment up. So I actually do think it was probably a huge misunderstanding between the two of them. Mm. Um, Head has owned his actions, and Siraj um, seemed he wanted to blame the whole thing on Head, oh, which just it didn't quite ring true. Um, that, it's an ugly moment in the game that it doesn't need anymore. So that, that used to be relatively commonplace and, and was pretty cringeworthy and the game's better off that that's been cleaned up um yeah so worthy of of disciplinary action just just a small a small percentage of the match fee uh, to avoid that um and hopefully it doesn't flavor too much of what's to come because australia india test series are tinder boxes they are they're tense they are fiercely contested and they have a history of flashpoints so hopefully this gets contained and dealt with and doesn't spill on. Um, I don't know whether it will or it won't. There was people sort of made something of the hug between Siraj and Head after the game. That that there was no warmth in that at all. There was, clear, there was clearly <laughs> all for show. residual. I'm glad you said oh, that, Jerry, because it was one show. of the it was one of the coldest yeah. hugs I've ever seen. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So let's not pretend that they sorted it out. Mm. Maybe the discipline reaction helps on that front. Uh, and the small things in these series can really grow. So I, I hope that's not the case. But, yeah, it's, the game is better off without that. You, you, you shouldn't have a send-off in those moments, regardless of what level of misunderstanding took place. Jared, uh, a guy that I'm familiar with, Todd Greenberg, with my rugby league background, uh, he's been announced that he's going to be taking over at Cricket Australia soon. Do you anticipate any huge changes with Todd Gr- Greenberg uh, getting involved, mate? I think so. He's a great choice, um, having already run one of the major sports in Australia. He's done all the groundwork across four years with the Players Association, so he's got 
a tremendous understanding of the way that cricket is evolving and cricket has just moved so far and will continue to do so. So what you'd love to have a little peek 10 years into the future and see what franchise cricket looks like versus international cricket, what the place of tests and T20s, are we still playing 50 over cricket? So this is a really interesting period to navigate through what's on the domestic front and, um, and making sure cricket either holds or just reinforces its place on the calendar. It seems it's shrunk a little with the spread of footy um, and would do well to have its elbows out to reclaim it. But with matches that mean something, my main thing with Todd, so we've chatted for about three years now on our SEM test cricket coverage, is he talks about jeopardy, games with jeopardy. And that's been one of the problems with cricket is test cricket has jeopardy. But the ODIs that we're fed each summer seem to be absolutely meaningless and we play B teams when we front up in T20s. See if you can come up with a calendar that actually engages us in the old way. It's not just putting a game of cricket on, it's putting a meaningful game of cricket on. Mm. So, yeah, I think he's a he's a great mind to have come into it. He comes with a, a clean slate. I think a mandate for some change as well and, and I'm super excited to see where he's able to take it knowing that there are limitations because of India's political and economic might and the ICC's sort of toothless approach to these things. All right, we're going to have to let you go, mate. I could sit here all day and chat cricket with you, as I'm sure the rest of the SEN uh, listeners would do as well. But thanks very much for joining us on the run home. Jared Waitley, and we'll catch you uh, up there at the Gabba doing what you do best. Ripper, lads. Good on you. There he was, the great Jared Waitley. Don't forget you can catch him and the rest of the SEN team live from the Gabba on Saturday, Saturday rather for the third test. Brisbane listeners, you can tune in real time on the SEN app with SEN Stadium at the Gabba.